So in the book, I, I, I start to look quite critically at uh, a lot of contemporary anarchist practice and thinking that goes into, into that practice. And the reason that I did that was because I needed to in engage with some of the ways that people were, were doing what I thought was potentially very, very interesting, very useful, very powerful things, but not always kind of doing them in the way that I thought was, was most ben beneficial. I didn't look as much at the positive things um, that, that do exist um, and, that, and that can exist. I, I think starting point is to say there have always been any number of examples that you can look to of, of, of people doing things in, in better ways, in, in more productive ways. And some of those are intentionally designed to, to change the world. Some of them are just things that people do. So people grow their vegetables and people look after their families and people make their own beer and do all sorts of things that, that are kind of contrary to, to capitalism, contrary to the state, contrary to the logics that they impose on us. But they're not necessarily intended to, to, to do anything other than to serve those kind of immediate needs of, of people. And those are absolutely great. We need to kind of celebrate those, diversify those and think about how they can kind of be multiplied. But we also need to think strategically about how we how we create that diverse, diversification and how we how we multiply that how we make those things bigger and stronger and then also to think about what happens when we meet the inevitable resistance that we will meet if and when those things become more powerful so for me a starting point really is to is to look at what people are already doing look at the kind of countless practices that people are engaging with uh, and look at the way that actually capitalism and the state have fed off those productive human activities so rather than thinking that we need to start thinking afresh about what we about what we could possibly do so we have all those kind of the seeds of those ideas we have the the, the cultures of those practices but they've been as Colin Ward so kind of eloquently says they've been weighed down by the by the weight of the state so it's finding those spaces and finding the ways we can kind of multiply them and diversify them. So I'm very interested in this idea that's sometimes referred to as prefiguration, the idea of building up these kind of counter powers, these counter cultures, these counter practices, multiplying them, making them bigger and stronger. In the book, I talk about there being two, two different ways to think about prefiguration. Um, and I'll go into those two separate ways in, in a minute, but I think it's really important to register that even though I talk about them separately for analytical purposes, um, they're actually completely uh, symbiotic, they have to work together. So I talk about social prefiguration and individual prefiguration. Social prefiguration I, I think of as, as all these kind of examples of people getting together to do things often outside of the market but importantly I think for me not always outside of the market. So a really good example is cooperatives. There's lots of different types of cooperatives, lots of different models and organisational forms but fundamentally they're democratic organisations. They're not revolutionary or anarchistic um, or even particularly radical in, in and of themselves necessarily and there's lots of co-ops that you can look to that, that aren't very inspiring but the fundamental idea of them bringing people together to work horizontally without a leader in a democratic way I think is, is quite inspiring and because it's inspiring it has inspired lots and lots of people to do really interesting things with it. So lots of people, myself included, have set up co-ops to do things like make beer, um, to make other products and services, but also to provide housing, to look after elderly people or sick people. So I'd, I'd like to see us engaging much more in things like cooperatives and, and similar projects of cooperative activity. One really crucial thing that I I talk about a bit in the book why, again, I felt that need to kind of look at some of the problems is what I started to see within anarchist culture, particularly in the 90s and 2000s, is a, a kind of purity around this prefiguration, an anarchist sensibility or an anarchist common sense where if we were going to build these things, they had to be perfectly anarchistic. They had to be absolutely 
run and managed according to our values. And that's very understandable and is part of the anarchist ethos that, that, we, that we employ a kind of means and ends compatibility, that we don't just employ any means to get to the ends that we want. It's fundamental to kind of anarchist thinking. But I think often that was taken too literally. And so what you started to see was people engaging with prefiguration in ways that were very kind of pure because they weren't in any way connected, although obviously they were because you can't fundamentally avoid the market or the state. But as best as possible, people were trying to do these things that, were, that had no kind of connection with the outside world. And I think that's very limiting. Uh, it's very limiting to, the, to what we can, we can do with those things. Um, they become very insular and very, uh, remain very small. They don't become influential. They don't inspire people. Um, and it's very hard to see how from those spaces of prefigurative practice you're ever going to really kind of build out a wider movement. So I think anarchists need to be more willing to think about the, the difficulties of engaging with, with some of the things that we might not like at the moment and potentially we might not like in the future. So a really good example of that is the market. I personally don't see a viable anarchist economy that doesn't have some element of the market. And some, some anarchists reject the market entirely, some, some accept it. But certainly within this anarchist common sense, the idea that you would do something within the capitalist market that we live in now was really, was really seen as, as selling out, was seen as being a reformist gesture at best, but really not understood as being radical. But I think we need to think about how we, how we develop those things that, that engage in the institutions and the cultures and the structures of the world, such as the capitalist market but how we, how we develop those in more progressive ways. So I'd like to see, as one example, a lot more cooperatives, a lot more kind of cooperative projects, a lot more buildings, social centres, clubs that are run on kind of anarchist lines. And, and to see a lot more of this, um, being brave enough to spread out, to go to places where people don't already share our ideas. So another example is, is, is working in schools, whether that's as a teacher, formally or whether that's as someone who goes in to, to engage. Again, there was lots of lots of kind of anarchist cultures where people wouldn't do something like that because the school was seen as an institute of the state and we shouldn't we shouldn't engage with that. It was to it was to kind of fail our on our anarchist principles if we if we kind of went and engaged with that. But we have to educate not only children but also ourselves and our communities. So we have to be out there, we have to be speaking with and working with people who don't agree with everything that we that we do and i think the paradox is the more we do that the stronger we become we it, 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 these things are more difficult when there's less of it happening and if we remain in these in these purest bubbles then they they have their capacity to exist in their in their kind of alleged purity um, but but they're never they're never getting anywhere. So you've always got that power of the state. You're not building up a counter power. So the more we do that, the stronger the stronger we become, and the, and the and the fewer challenges we face from the market or the state. Obviously, we're going to face many many challenges. But I think if you think of yourself as an anarchist, if you think of yourself as wanting to change the world, you have to start from a point of thinking there's going to be challenges that these things are going to be difficult and we're going to face resistance. So the idea of just avoiding that resistance for me is, is a fundamental failure of thinking. So yeah, uh, I mean fundamentally this is about creating however you might think of them, projects, organisations, spaces, um, but building these things that can, that can bring people together, and that can show a positive vision, that can show a positive alternative but can also build an, an example of that positive alternative. So having that focus um, of, of, of something, whether it's a, a, a vegetable growing project or a popular education project or, or a, a, a community beer making project, having something that, that you can kind of establish, that you can bring people into, that you can use to demonstrate the way you can do things differently, 
that you can use to promote some of those ideas. But having that flexibility, and I think this is yeah, really, really crucial, having that flexibility uh, to, to think critically the whole time as to where you, where you kind of tread the line between being open enough to bring people in, so not being so closed that you're, you, this has to be this perfect anarchist project. The only people who can be involved are people who are already a perfect anarchist. Everything that, that happens within it has to be perfectly commensurate with anarchist values. You do that, you're not going to get anywhere. But conversely, if you, if you open up too much, if you say, well, I'll just, I'll just do anything, um, then obviously you're not, you're not uh, engaging in an anarchist project. So I think for me, the real kind of art of this, and it is an art, it's not, it's not a science, it's not something that you can prescribe in advance too much to say how each individual project is going to run, but the art of it is to try and negotiate that compromise so that you are not being pushed too far towards towards the, the mainstream, towards capitalism or the state or however you want to think of it, but also how you're not kind of running away from those things too much. And I talk about the slippery slope in, in, in the book um, as a kind of common metaphor in the English language of, of being somewhere where you're kind of often seen as being inevitably sent downwards. Um, and, I, and I say we have to kind of resist the idea that we're going to be always co-opted, these things are always going to fail if we engage with those, with those things. For some, for some people that means engaging more with the state, certainly on the, on the local or the municipal level. It's not something I've ever done and I think that's also important is we, we have our own kind of personal and emotional relationships with, with compromise and, and how much we're prepared to kind of move in one di direction or another. But I've certainly had um, experiences with people who work for local government who've been incredibly helpful for the things that I've been doing and for the other radicals have been doing. And I'd like to see more kind of acceptance that even though this is part of the state, it's something we can work with and we should think about pulling them towards us rather than us making constant concessions towards them. And then another crucial element of this, which I call personal prefiguration, is how we embody these things in our personal lives. And again, there's no, there's no kind of black and white blueprint as to how this, how this can, can play out. Um, and there's certainly no prescription as to what any one of us as individuals should do. But I think whilst we saw in, in that period of the 2000s and uh, of the 90s if this huge interest in prefigurative projects, there wasn't the same interest in, in how we lived our lives as individuals. And actually there was often resistance, and there has been a lot of resistance within anarchist cultures, to the idea that we should try and change ourselves. And for a lot of people that's seen as as a concession to, to capitalism, to the state, it's supposed to kind of suggest that we have more, uh, that we're empowered when we're not. It, it's seen as being politically uh, incorrect to suggest that we should take responsibility for our lives when we're, we're structurally kind of boundary to, to, to live and work in so many different ways. It's also seen as a, as a bit of a middle class pursuit, it's seen as something that people with privilege are able to do to kind of live more ethically, um, whereas people who are, who are kind of struggling more will, will, will not be able to do that. But I think that's a very, very superficial reading of what I call personal prefiguration. And I'd like to see a much kind of stronger defense of that personal pre prefiguration. Because of all those, all those kind of social projects that I'm talking about, whether it's co-ops or education or, 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 or whatever it is, those things for me will never flourish and grow if we're not also thinking about how we engage with them on a personal level. How do we connect to the marketplace? How do we connect to our workplace? How do we connect to our neighbourhood? How do we connect to, to our daily practices? So seemingly simple things like how we, how we travel, where we shop, how we treat our neighbours, how we engage with our community. All of these things I think we should think about politically. And that doesn't mean that we can live a, a, a somehow eth ethically pure life. That's not the suggestion with people who, who defend this position.
It's also not the suggestion that everyone can do the same as everyone else, or that indeed everyone should do the same as everyone else. Clearly people with, for example, people with levels of economic privilege are much more able to buy organic food, as one example. Um, they're more able to, to take the train rather than take a plane on holiday to do many things that we might kind of conventionally think of as being more, more ethical. It's fundamentally important to recognise that not everyone can do the same thing as everyone else. But that's never been the argument that I think, I think that's a, a false argument that people make. But I don't see how you build a, an anarchist community or an anarchist society or how you really develop those projects without the individual commitments to those things without us thinking about the way the state and capitalism have, have pushed us to live certain lives and without starting to push back against those things. And I really like Landauer's idea or suggestion that, that very few people, lots of anarchists like to, 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 to moan about the lack of freedom that they have in a capitalist society. And we should moan about those things, of course. But Landau says, who can honestly say they've used the freedom that they do have as best they can? Who can honestly say they've, they've lived as well as, they, as well as they could? And I think very few of us could say that. And arguably, none of us will ever do that. And there's always reasons for, of habit, of emotion, family, other, other kind of relationships. There's all sorts of things that inhibit our capacity to live as best as we can. But I think we have to start with a basic premise that we should try to, that we should try to begin to, to question our behaviours, to question whether we need the, the, to live the kind of lives we lead, the, the, the material abundance and wealth that we have, and start to, start to kind of begin to unpick those things and, and start to challenge those things. Because an anarchist society, a society without capitalism and without exploitation, will be a radically different society. It will mean that lots of the things that we have now won't exist. I'd like to think there'll be lots more beautiful things, there'll be lots of things that will replace those things, that we will enjoy much more, that will make us much more happy, much more well-rounded well individuals. But we do have to think about the things that we will lose if, we're, if, if, we, if we get rid of capitalism. But rather than waiting for the end of capitalism to get rid of those things from our lives, I think we have to start trying to do that day by day, little by little, as much as we can. And it's not an all or nothing thing, and it's not an immediate thing, in the same way that developing these projects isn't an instantaneous revolutionary moment. It's a process of growth and emergence and learning. So too with our, with our personal lives, how we develop as individuals, and the more we do it, the easier it becomes, the more we find networks of people that think the same, and the more that personal behaviour is able to help those social prefigurative projects, those worker co-ops, those, those growing projects. And the more they develop, the easier it becomes for us to do that on an individual level. So I think fundamentally we have to, we have to think of those two things not as separate, we can think about them separately, analytically, if we're asking particular questions about how we engage with them, but politically, strategically, I think we have to think of those things as fundamentally connected. So yeah, I think to, to kind of wrap up, the, the answers are there really. We have, we have all these different ways of organising that are different. We have so many, we have such a vast history within the anarchist tradition, but also within countless other traditions of people getting on, self-organising, looking after themselves, doing things differently. And we, have to, we have to learn from those things. Um, and without being too prescriptive or without thinking there's one particular way we have to approach these things, I think we just have to spend a lot more time developing those things. And that doesn't mean that we stop criticising the state or we stop going on protests or we stop doing some of, the, some of those um, critical forms of politics. But I think in terms of the balance of our, of our energy, I think we need to go a, a m much further towards that creation of the positives and spend much less time endlessly kind of critiquing what's wrong 
and, and trying to kind of produce what we think is right. Thank you.